Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us here. Session five, step five of the adaptation workbook course. Um, so we're glad as always to have you here with us. And just a reminder that we are recording these lectures and continuing to add them to the YouTube page. So you can come back and relive this or share it with your teammates or coworkers if this seems like it might be interesting to them. Um, folks will be able to follow along with all of the lectures for this course. And Patricia already has a newsletter queued up to send out after this lecture wraps up with relevant links and a place to get this recording. So thanks, Patricia. Okay, so today we're gonna to be covering the fifth step of the adaptation workbook, which is our monitoring step. So we'll do you know, a little discussion about monitoring and climate change adaptation um, and the, what we're kind of looking for with that step. Um, we'll again, walk through a little bit of a tutorial on what you'll see in the workbook uh, about how to uh, accomplish this step. We'll talk about some material for next week and then I'm planning a little longer time for Q&A today. So for those of you who are interested, um, please feel free to stick around for that. I have received a couple of questions over the last day or two on my email. And then uh, Steve Harris went through all of the homework responses this morning from the last couple of weeks. Thanks, Steve. And he pulled out a couple lingering questions that uh, seemed like we should probably discuss them. They might be pertinent to more than just one project team. So uh, stay tuned for that at the end of of the lecture today. So we're completing the cycle here in our adaptation workbook. Um, our monitoring step is about learning from our actions, uh, learning what works, what doesn't work, and then can we carry that forward into subsequent management decisions? This is you know, often the step that closes any real adaptive management process or cycle. So you're, you're probably used to thinking about monitoring at the end of a flow chart like this. And so we'll talk about it a little bit here and, and maybe um, our specific spin that we're putting, putting on this monitoring idea uh, for the purposes of this workbook and for this course. So for the adaptation workbook, our key questions really are, how do we know if your selected adaptation actions were effective? What can we learn from these actions to inform future management? You'll notice there are a lot of topics that are not included on this list. We're not focusing on monitoring how does climate change play out in your project area. We're not really intent on monitoring the, the changes in temperature and precipitation or how the impacts themselves play out. Um, and that is really to kind of try to put some blinders on this or, or some guardrails on this step, which can start to feel a little sprawly and, and overwhelming. If you start to think about all of the information that you wish you knew. Um, so we're asking you to, if it helps to really put a bullseye on effectiveness, how can we gauge whether your adaptation actions are effective as you're implementing them or after you've implemented them? I know many of you came into this course with assessment and evaluation at the forefront of what you wanted to do. Um, and we, we talked about this in our preliminary webinar uh, before the course got going, that we didn't really want to see monitoring, evaluation, assessment as part of your management goals and objectives. We, we told you in many cases, save those ideas for this step, save those ideas for this step. And so I hope that you did. I hope you retained those. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, opening remark that, that I wanted to offer is another way to kind of put some guardrails on this monitoring discussion and to 
um, make things a little more efficient and, and useful for yourselves is to think about what kind of rigor do you need in your monitoring and assessment? Um, and this is to try to right size your, your monitoring program or, or your monitoring approach. Um, and so just, just to spell out a couple different um, levels of rigor when it comes to monitoring and assessment. Um, and so obviously the, the benchmark, kind of the, the highest level of rigor that could be expected would be kind of a, a scientific grade monitoring protocol where you would actually try to determine if an outcome is statistically significant compared to a control and can you extend those conclusions elsewhere on the landscape with a kind of a controlled and replicated experimental design. And so I would say it is rare with the folks that we work with on climate change adaptation, it is rare that they pursue scientific grade um, monitoring and assessment of their adaptation outcomes. It's just not in the purview of many land management organizations. Um, but we don't have to rule it out because there may be partners that are very interested in, in helping you conduct this level of, of rigorous monitoring for their own purposes, whether you have partners at a university or, or uh, other organization that you know, works with master students or PhD students. Um, or that does this kind of research like NRRI uh, in Minnesota. Um, so I don't, I don't mean to exclude scientific research from this discussion. I just want folks to think very clearly about it. Um, we do have some, some excellent climate adaptation projects that are pursuing research grade monitoring. Um, and we can share some of those examples if it's, if it's useful. But they're, they're limited. More often, we get people thinking about these, these next couple of categories, um, and that is impact or response monitoring. So response monitoring is basically what you can detect through repeated, um, repeated measurements or repeated surveys through time. But it's not necessarily going to include replication. It might not even include a controlled treatment, you know, but you are tracking change through time, say through repeated forest inventory or you know, wildlife population monitoring. Um, implementation monitoring, well, that's maybe the most basic, perhaps even more basic than is necessary. Um, and that's just keeping track of, did you do the adaptation actions that you set out to do? Did you complete them on the schedule? When did you, you know, how did you accomplish them? Um, but there may be some inst instances where it does make sense to include some just basic implementation monitoring as part of your approach to this. If, for example, you have um, some tactics that are tentative or that depend on other things, then you might want to actually monitor, did you, did you ultimately do those? If, if for example, you had a you know, complicated regime of prescribed fire and site preparation treatments, then it might make sense to do some implementation monitoring through time. Um, effectiveness monitoring is a little bit more rigorous than just impact or response monitoring um, because you're not only doing that repeated measurement through time to detect a trend or a change, um, but you're actually uh, trying to capture some of those other surrounding variables that could influence that change to be able to say with a little more clarity, was it our action? Was it our, our adaptation action that caused this trend? Or was it some other background influence that caused the trend? So kind of an intermediate grade between scientific research and response monitoring. Maybe more detail than you need it, but again, just um, quick discussion of some, some different levels of rigor, uh, maybe to stimulate some, some thought on different pathways y'all might choose. As we get into what the workbook asks of you, 
for this monitoring step. Um, basically, we're trying to help you pull together your own custom adaptation plan for this project. So we ask you to assemble a list of monitoring items. That starts with listing different monitoring variables. Um, and so what are you going to measure? Again, try to pay attention to things that you can measure that will help you gauge um, effectiveness of your adaptation actions and whether or not you're accomplishing your management goals and objectives. Um, and so uh, Melissa Gabrielson turned me on to um, this, uh, this species and, and this scenario. This is not something I was familiar with before a week ago. Um, but Melissa uh, shared with me a, um, yeah, thanks Melissa. Um, yeah, a, a, a biological assessment of spectacled eiders uh, up in far northern Alaska. Um, and so many problems uh, uh, facing this critter. Um, but one thing that seems to be critical and variable across spectacle eider populations is nesting success. And so if you were, you know, up in Barrow, Alaska, and if you were thinking about how to help this one given population of spectacle eiders adapt to a changing climate, one of the risks that you would probably have thought about was how might climate change affect um, nest predation? Um, you know, it seems like, you know, uh, other birds like Jaegers, uh, foxes, other things are common nest predators for eiders. And so let's say we imagined a adaptation action where we're setting up some temporary solar powered electrical fencing around a critical nesting habitat for these eiders. I don't even know if that's feasible. Melissa can probably tell me, but that's what I'm proposing. So we're doing some solar powered electrical fencing around this nesting area. And so the thing we really care about is nest success. So that's what we're going to list as my monitoring variable here. Um, what's the criteria for evaluation? Well, looking across um, the, the data in this report that Melissa shared, it looks like nesting success, success can go anywhere from 2% to 70%. Um, depending on where you are. And so for us, we're gonna set a benchmark as 50% being a meaningful criteria for evaluation. We ask you, this is a, a distinct um, item. We ask you to put in your monitoring plans because we want you to have a threshold in mind that will help you gauge, has my action been effective or not? Um, and so we, we do ask you to give yourself a goal or a target to shoot for. Um, and this might be easier in some cases than others. In some cases, you might just do a directional criteria. Is this variable increasing or decreasing compared to our starting point? That's okay too. Um, but anyway, shooting from the hip, this was my criteria for a nest success. The other reason we ask you to do this is that you may have a, a criteria that if you don't meet the criteria after a certain amount of time, it may prompt you to do another adaptation action. That may prompt you to change course. If you're you know, banging your head against the wall repeatedly and not having success, then this, this criteria is kind of your decision point for maybe changing your action in the future. And then we ask you to provide a few notes on implementation. How would you actually conduct this monitoring um, if you need notes about the timing, critical timing for doing this kind of measurement, or if there are partners out there, university partners, um, other organizations who can help you do this, funding sources to tap into, you know, whatever, whatever information will help you think about how to carry out this monitoring. Think of this as kind of your notes section on how to implement. And like I mentioned, if you have a maybe a supplemental action in mind there, that uh, if, you, if you don't hit that criteria after a certain amount of time, 
this is a place to put that in there. So I'm maybe if our electrical fences don't work after five years and we still haven't boosted our nesting success, maybe we'll move on to something more extreme like predator hazing to get those Jaegers and foxes out of our critical nesting habitat um, while nests are occupied. So that's the, that's the nuts and bolts. We're asking you to brainstorm a list of variables, criteria, and implementation notes. Um, and so this is, again, it's going to hinge, uh, it's going to always come back to um, what are the adaptation actions you have decided to recommend? How will you know if those are effective? How will you know if you are achieving your management objectives or not? And so just a few more make-believe examples here um, that might uh, relate to some of your project ideas. Um, we ask you to um, keep, this, keep this realistic. We know that monitoring is often limited by time, limited by funding. It's the, the thing that gets ignored when new shiny objects uh, come into your, into your life or across your desk. Um, but at the same time, um, I don't think any of you will blow this off because many of you had, again, monitoring and, and assessment as one of the first things you wanted to do because you know there are information gaps. And, and getting this information is going to be really helpful to your successors um, or to you a couple of years from now to know if, if your adaptation actions are moving in the right direction or not. Um, so, Marta, um, I'm looking to you now to maybe offer some of your <laughs> more informed thoughts about climate adaptation and monitoring. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in a little bit as, so the background for this is that um, a lot of the, the research that I do is uh, often making use of monitoring uh, programs that weren't even necessarily designed for climate change monitoring or uh, looking across the landscape at, at different uh, different areas that might have slightly different monitoring. And there's there's a couple of things that I think are really useful to think about both in terms of your specific project, but also kind of future, potentially bigger picture questions. So, so the main one that I would say is really thinking about putting everything as detailed as possible into writing for your monitoring protocol, um, even things that that may seem like they're they're pretty obvious. So, so from just like a very practical standpoint, you know, we sometimes change jobs and change roles, or potentially you've got interns coming in and helping uh, from year to year. So you really want to make sure that. Uh, your monitoring protocol were, you know, especially like looking at, at these examples, a lot of these are continued for, for many years. So it may be continued for, for longer than your involvement with a project. So things like if monitoring is initiated by a certain event, what's that event? Um, are there times when maybe monitoring doesn't happen because of natural disasters? Um, so I, I've done a lot of work with uh, sea turtle nesting monitoring in national parks. And you know, anytime there's a government shutdown, monitoring doesn't happen. Anytime there's a hurricane, monitoring sometimes happens early for those nest inventories, things like that. Um, and it can be pretty variable as to whether their protocols include when those kind of things are initiated and whether the the actual notes for, you know, if you're thinking about a sheet that is going to be standardized and every person who goes out and does the monitoring is filling out, whether those notes section even is, is like reasonably standardized so someone can, can do a quick search of a spreadsheet. Um, things like materials, so thinking about Stephen's example, like what materials are going into those uh, predator deterrents, um, when are they being installed? 
right? Is it as soon as the nest is laid? Is there uh, potentially a little bit of a window of time which may, uh, some may be different for, for different predators? Uh, so those are all going to be really important. And then in terms of thinking about, you know, this kind of scientific research side of things. So with a lot of statistical methods that we can use these days, we can do a lot more with uh, messy data. Like we, we can get a, a better picture of how things are going, even in situations where we don't have a the nice like repeated uh, controlled experiment that we, we probably learned about if we took any statistics classes uh, at any point. Like there's a lot we can do with, with sort of mess these days. So, so I think there is a lot of potential for these monitoring data, even if, if you aren't designing your monitoring with that in mind for collaboration with scientists um, within your organization at universities, USGS. So I, I do some work now with using uh, monitoring data that's collected by Department of Natural Resources uh, across the Midwest. So all of that can be really important. Um, and again, comes back to that, having that really detailed monitoring protocol, right? So in Steven's example with the nest success, for example, um, how, how are you counting nest success, right? So if you think about it as the, per, say the percent of eggs that hatch, um, if we're thinking about predators, right? Depending on when we're doing those nesting surveys, right? If we're counting the eggs just at the end. So, so this comes up more often with sea turtles, for example, than usually with, uh, nesting birds, you can count the eggs at the beginning and count the egg fragments or fledglings at the end. Um, but having both of those numbers, right? Because if you're dealing with just the numbers at the end, you maybe aren't taking into account any of those eggs that were, were snatched by predators and then can't be counted. So, you know, thinking about those things um, and really like taking note and including those will, uh, kind of make that more useful for, for everyone. Um, the other thing that is maybe a possibility in some of these systems is thinking about what monitoring is happening at similar uh, management areas close by, um, if, especially if they're taking different management approaches than you. Those uh, have the potential to kind of act as controls. So you know, talking to other managers and if there's some sort of long-term data set or, or kind of simple thing that you can, you can add in to, it may be like adjusting the timing of when you do a certain type of monitoring or something like that, that as long as it doesn't get overwhelming and add too many, that shouldn't be like the, the first goal, but there is some potential to, to kind of think about, about that too. Um, and I think that's my, those would be my sort of big takeaways. That's really great, Marta. Thanks for helping us get a little more detail. Um, I'll pause now and see if there are questions about monitoring, monitoring specifically for climate adaptation effectiveness. Um, yeah, if you're wondering how to fit this into your usual agency protocols of monitoring. I love having Marta on the call uh, in this lecture. All of you and your collective experience uh, represents a lot of exposure to agency and university monitoring as well. So um, yeah, any questions? Feel free hey, to- Hey, Steven. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, coming from a forest, you know, that doesn't have a lot of people or a lot of funding. I know monitoring can sometimes be extremely difficult and people just don't have time to do it. So could you possibly make a suggestion on what's the minimum that you think people could get away with, but still have a good product? Yeah, 
that's hard that's hard to answer i okay so here's here's this as a a challenge for you um let's say for every adaptation tactic that you recommend i think it would be worth trying to come up with one monitoring idea to let you at least force you to think how would i know if this adaptation action was actually successful um, because if you're doing some adaptation actions but monitoring their effectiveness seems too difficult or out of the uh, you know out of your ability um, then maybe that's a clue that you're trying too many things or it's time to maybe reach out to some partners who can help with monitoring. That's a great answer. I swear, you did not feed me that question ahead of time. There's no financial arrangement here, folks, between me and Steve. <laughs> um, Sharon, I see your question in the chat. Um, and maybe this is something that Marta can help with too. Marta, do you see this? question yeah yeah so i see it um so the question is about uh how to decide the criteria for evaluation especially when there's differing opinions about it so looking at young forest projects successful if bird species richness increases or if golden winged warblers occupy a certain percent others would say only successful if uh golden wing warblers are confirmed breeding or successfully fledged young. So I would say in a lot of these situations, there is a kind of more, I guess, more perfect approach, right? Like in an ideal world, um, if we're trying to evaluate the sort of success of a species in a, what we, we would determine as a breeding habitat, um, so that's gonna differ a little bit on your question, whether, whether you care about occupancy or care about it as as a breeding habitat so in, a, in an ideal situation right you would uh monitor for successful for that fitness level right so the the successful uh fledging of young um but in a lot of situations we're not going to have necessarily the the kind of manpower to do that right it's it's much easier whether it's it's you or you know with birds, of course, it it's a, it can be a little bit easier to get uh, citizen volunteers uh, who are pretty knowledgeable to to go out and do do some surveys, which really gets at those richness questions. Um, so that might be the best you can do. You'll always have those critics um, who say like, "Well, you didn't really evaluate the breeding success." Um, but you can't always. So I think it, it really depends on what you have at your disposal. It will also depend a little bit on, uh, I guess, your your reasoning, right? Like if you're potentially trying to like justify a, a habitat and need to prove that it's successful breeding habitat and breeding habitat is, uh, and the outcomes are improving, whether it's for a funding agency or uh, a state or federal agency, um, then you maybe need to kind of up that uh, monitoring to, to include that. But hopefully in those situations, you could also get the funding for doing that kind of monitoring too. Sharon, any, any follow-up comments on that? Uh, no, that was a really good answer, Marta. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's real. I guess it really is just coming up with a justification of why we chose our evaluation criteria and um, and get that get that in writing with it. Yeah, and I think you know time and money is a justification for uh, a lot of of a lot of what we do and the the kind of realities of of situations too. Um, so like we we can't have the like perfectly designed experiments and monitoring in every situation so so figuring out how to use what you have at your disposal uh the best way possible this is great other other uh comments or questions 
this is a good time for us to pause and hear what y'all are grappling with when it comes to monitoring. Okay, well, Marta mentioned a couple things that, that continued, can continue to be your, um, your guideposts. Um, and that's, you know, living in reality, you know, you, you can recognize your, your constraints um, and also try to think, um, think critically, like, yeah, what, what are, what's gonna be that useful source of information for you and your successors? Um, even if it's not perfect, um, what can help your help your knowledge? Okay, I'm going to continue sharing my screen here. We'll keep keep moving. Okay, so what will this actually look like in the adaptation workbook? Um, when you enter step five, and after you've uh, lifted up the course materials and, and step instructions. Um, you'll start with a pretty blank canvas um, with this tempting orange button asking you to add monitoring variables. Um, and so you'll start there. And then this is going to be a little bit like generating adaptation tactics. Right? You'll have a, a pop-up window each time where you are documenting your details about the variable, the criteria, and implementation notes. After you save that variable, then you get to apply it to your different objectives. Um, and so you may, for example, you may have, uh, you may be able to do some efficient working in the workbook here if one monitoring variable might apply to multiple objectives. Right, you can carry it across. Um, and then this is also a good check for you. If you have objectives with no monitoring items associated with them, that's a, that's a red flag. Hey, how will I know if I'm actually attaining this objective? And did I have adaptation actions to help me accomplish this objective? So if you have any orphans, that's a, an indication to go back and do a little, little more work and think about at least one monitoring item for each of your objectives. So just, uh, I guess, just, just something to remind again, remember this application step as you're brainstorming, remember to go back and actually link those adaptation variables to the different objectives. This is gonna show up in the, ultimately the report that you produce. So it's, it's important to make those connections. A couple of easy homework answers this time. Um, and so similar to, to what you've already been um, expecting for all the other homework steps. And then um, if you have a CD-ROM on your computer, open the CD-ROM at this point because Blitter will pop out and you have completed the adaptation workbook. Um, and this is when you actually get to see what it looks like to export your, your adaptation plan that you've put together. Um, maybe you've already checked on this uh, along the way, these adaptation plans, you've been building it the whole time you've been working on this, um, on this course. Um, and so it's a chance to dive in there and see, okay, how has this actually been organized um, and you'll, you'll see it's the plans get organized by the management topics or the categories that you created at the beginning of this course and each uh, of them then will have each of the step, uh, step by step information associated with that category. Um, you can, yep, you can save this as a PDF or you can print it. Um, that's what it's it's designed to be useful for you. Um, so you don't have to keep it within the ad online adaptation workbook. 
Um, yeah, and this can be final whenever you decide it's final. Um, so you, you, know, you can keep coming back and tinkering with this, um, but I wanted to be sure to let you know that whenever you feel like you're done uh, and have, have all your loose ends tied up, um, please remember to take a copy of your work. Um, Okay, so uh, a quick and dirty rundown of this week's expectation, add monitoring variables, associate them with your objectives, complete the homework, export and share your plan, save it as a PDF. Um, if you have questions about anything, about how it looks, about what's in there, let us know as your, as your course instructors. Um, We're asking you to complete this step again by um, next Monday and to complete your homework by Monday morning. Next week's discussion is going to focus on communication uh, and helping you tell the story of your adaptation project and to get a little practice um, giving a, a mock presentation of how to you know how to pitch the projects that you have come up with. So we'll have a, we'll have some tips um, and communi climate communication concepts for you next week's lecture. We have discussion session next Tuesday and Wednesday, and that's where we will review your progress on step four and step five. So next week in discussion, you'll get to actually share your ideas on what adaptation actions you developed and the monitoring plan that you developed. So be ready to, to share some of that by next week. If you're still catching up on step four, we get it. We know that can be a, a really convoluted one. Um, so it's okay if you still have a little bit of work to go. You're not gonna have to talk about it until the middle of next week. So, that's kind of the end of our, our formal lecture for this week. Um, but like I mentioned, I've, I've got some questions that have come in over email um, and that Steve collected from the homeworks. And so I thought it would be good to uh, address some of those now, just in case uh, some of these are questions that other folks have too. So if, uh, if you feel like you're done and you don't have any questions, no offense if you want to peel off early, but I will, um, I'll read through these questions first, uh, just so you can get a sense, well, do any of these apply to me or not? Cool. Okay. So a couple of questions from homework. Um, do, do, do. Should I add more tactics? Um, to my adaptation project. Um, it would be great to get feedback on the adaptation approaches we have done so far. Also, can you describe the differences between adaptation actions, strategies, and tactics? That was a question. Um, um, other questions that have come in. How do you get colleagues, partners, et cetera, thinking about these concepts and having conversations about climate adaptation, especially if they are resistant to change or not interested in changing day-to-day -day operations? It's definitely gonna be a topic for next week, but we can talk about it a little now. Um, I find myself looking at other strategies that are not included in the overall management plan as extra actions. Do I need to spell out each strategy within the management plan? And um, if there's any work or practices with mitigating the long-term effects of climate change, such as increasing temperature, should we try to adapt to those effects or should we just manage with that as an inevitability? and alter our plans around it. So those are, oh, and we have one more question about um, 
one project um, had Missa, this was you, uh, the, the NRCS group in the UP, coming up with kind of a, an overwhelming number of adaptation tactics and wondering if that means they're doing something wrong or, or if there's some way to be more efficient. So those are some of the questions I have on my list. Um, does that jive with anything you all are experiencing also? Do you have other questions that you wanna throw in the chat? You can put them in there now. And I'll run through that list. Patricia, I'm looking to you also to chime in on any of this, uh, please. Okay. Um, so, Okay, um, how can we get feedback on the approaches we're taking? Please, uh, if you have questions on any of your adaptation actions, first, first uh, option for you is to email your specific instructor for your project course. Each, each of you got signed with and uh, got uh, matched up with an instructor at the very beginning when we were brainstorming goals and objectives. So I would say reach out to them first. They will be able to log into the workbook and they can um, they can kind of masquerade as you and see your adaptation actions that you've spelled out or you can set up a quick zoom meeting and, and walk them through on the screen uh, what you're coming up with but that that's the first place to get feedback like i mentioned next week is our discussion session where you'll get a chance to review your adaptation ideas so if i guess do a little thinking ahead of that and think about if there are Maybe there's a couple particular tactics that you have the biggest questions about um, or that you want to bounce off of uh, folks in your discussion group you can be ready to, to share some of those. Um, describe the differences between adaptation actions, strategies, and tactics. Okay, this is a, um, uh, Linnea, this is your question. Let me know if I'm answering this or not. Um, so, uh, I try to be consistent, but sometimes I probably mix up my terminology. But with on our NIAX team, we try to be um, consistent that our menus, our adaptation menus, deal with strategies and approaches. Um, and that's the hierarchy of specificity that we use in our wildlife menu and in any of the menus that you may have perused uh, in, our, in our toolkit. So strategies are, um, they are general concepts that relate to how to adapt, um, how to adapt to certain aspects within a discipline. So within wildlife, we have strategies that relate to say, um, population connectivity and, uh, maybe like um, biotic interactions, human wildlife conflict, population levels. Those were all the strategy levels. There are 13 strategies, protected areas. Um, approaches underneath those, those offer more specifics on how you could actually carry out a given strategy. And so there are five to a dozen or more approaches so strategies, approaches, then tactics. Those are the specific actions that you are going to implement. You add tactical level details, um, prescriptive details about what, when, where, how. Um, you know, the, the tactics are what you're actually going to implement. Personally, sometimes I use actions and tactics interchangeably. So I'll talk about adaptation actions sometimes, um, but usually I'm using that to refer to tactics. Uh, Caitlin, you've got your hand up. Yeah, kind of a follow-up to that. Um, and I'm just diving into this step now because I'm a bit behind, so maybe it'll become clearer, but is it possible that tactics could at times overlap with your objectives? Or is there like a clear difference between an objective and a tactic? I found a couple of times when I was looking where I felt like 
the tactic I was about to write was an objective I already had, and then I just kind of got confused. So I don't know if that's just if anyone else is having that issue or if there's kind of a clear cutoff or just if it depends on the objective and there can be overlap. Patricia, you, you feel free to chime in here, but sometimes um, sometimes folks come in with um, goals and objectives and their objectives are actually, like you said, their objectives are actually kind of management tactics that um, are very prescriptive. Um, so there, there can be some overlap. We, we sometimes try to um, try to distinguish those a little more. Like if, if your goals and objectives felt very prescriptive at the outset, uh, hopefully one of us said something to you about that. Um, on the other hand, when you're writing a tactic and it feels redundant to an objective, well, maybe that's a chance to say, or to ask yourself, are there, are there more details that are necessary here to make this actually um, an implementable action that would be clear to communicate to someone else? Maybe there are more specific details that need to be added if, it's, if it seems too redundant to your objective. Uh, Patricia, what would you say there? Yeah, I agree with everything you said, Stephen. Um, and just maybe another way to think about your goals and objectives. Way back in step one, you identified what your goals and objectives were under business as usual, right? And throughout this course, we've layered on those climate change impacts and vulnerabilities. And we've thought about how those impacts and vulnerabilities affect your management goals and objectives. And in step four, what you're really focusing on is identifying additional actions or tweaking your management objectives, right? Your actions to make it more likely that you'll be successful in meeting those management goals and objectives. And so in some cases, you may have designed already a management goal and objective that addresses climate change and is exactly what you wanna do. And you'll just give yourself credit for that. Give yourself a big pat on the back. You know, this is great. You're double checking. This is in line with exactly what you need to do to continue managing a healthy population or ecosystem, even in the uncertainty of climate change. In other cases, you're going to see that your management objective might need a little more specificity in order to address the, the challenges and opportunities that you identified. So here you really want to think about, you know, if you're saying, you know, to do some sort of, of forest management, what species did you find were, were more vulnerable to climate change or less vulnerable to climate change? So which, which plant species are you promoting over other species? Or similarly, you know, what are those very specific climate connections that you're making to your management objectives so that you're really getting that full picture of how now this tactic is either the same or just a little bit different because of climate change. And, you know, if you have a lot of really specific management <laughs> objectives that you put into step one and you're, you're kind of feeling that kind of redundancy at this step, you might wanna take a step back at this point and, and start from that place, what's different? So instead of going through each objective and you know, kind of just rewriting the same thing, even though you're giving yourself credit for the good, good intentions that you had, maybe, yeah, just take a step back and think about, you know, so, so what is my biggest challenge? What is my biggest threat or vulnerability? And what do I need to do just a little bit differently in my management style in order to hit that target that I was shooting for? So... I think, yeah, if any 
anybody else have anything to, to chime in on that? Go for yes. it. Um, so that was perfect, Patricia. Thank you. I'm so glad I, I, I forgot to talk about patting yourself on the back, which is important. Um, Missa, uh, not to put you on the spot, I'm wondering if that, does that kind of connect to your question um, also? It, or is I there mean, anything you'd add? I feel like we're, yeah, we're, we're kind of in the same boat where our objectives were pretty detailed and prescriptive. <clears throat> and so now kind of what I'm hearing is, you know, to, to kind of try to take a step back and try to figure out what the challenges are and then tweak our tactics. I'm kind of thinking we could tweak the tactics to be a little more, to have more detail. Um, but we are running into redundancies, you know, so that's, you know, we don't, we didn't know how to group it where we could take credit for the approaches, I guess, and then um, kind of use that in our narrative as far as a selling point of why to do something, you know, like almost prioritize the tactics slash object objectives based on, I guess, need or, I don't know, feasibility. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm talking in circles too, so. No, I think, I think you, you nailed it on the head. Yeah, so as you start to look at your tactics and make them, specific and think about their ability to meet your challenges or address your site vulnerabilities, um, you might find that they become a little less redundant. Um, and um, I think too, yeah, if you think about, I think I lost my train of thought. I think you're better at going in circles <laughs> I am Missa, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that you're, you, you hit it right on the head that you're going to start um, seeing less redundancy. And then I think also when you're looking at the online workbook, there are a few different ways you can kind of start to group tactics under, um, you know, and assign them to, to different management objectives. And so if you have um, several tactics that are basically being employed to help you meet a single management objective, you can group those tactics together in the workbook. Um, and then yeah, when you go to print your workbook, I think you'll see that it, when it prints it out, those are more grouped together for you so that you can start to, to tell that story. And okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, because we were looking to lump it somehow. We just really, we wanted to be lumpers, but we didn't know how to lump it within the workbook book because we haven't seen the end result yet, you know, so we didn't jump ahead. So, but we yeah. might, you know, re reach out again to be like, all right, how do we lump these together? So you might be hearing from us. And if you're like me, you need to see that final product before you can kind of wrap your head around how all these pieces are fitting together. So you guys can actually like print your report at any time. Um, if you haven't done that already, that's in the left-hand navigation panel and there's a little export uh, button down at the bottom. It prints to a PDF. Um, and you can use that to kind of just scan through how the workbook has organized your information up until this point. And you might start to see then like, oh, wait a minute. No, I really need to group these things together a little bit better. Or you might even start to see how your adaptation actions could be better linked to step three or step you so that you're just yeah figuring out how to, to tweak those actions 
um, so that you're, you know, identifying, you know, exactly what species you're, you're trying to manipulate or, you know, exactly what components of a habitat you're looking at adjusting and, and all those other relevant details. Thanks for that. I think one of the most helpful things that will help me kind of stay on track was that just like the tactics should help us address the vulnerabilities. Like I think in my head, I was disconnecting a step. Like I would, I'm still also trying to parse through like all the strategies and approaches, like kind of reading through them. And I keep seeing one where I'm like, Ooh, I really like this. This looks good, but it's almost because it fits with one of my objectives already, instead of thinking about how it might lead to a tactic that addresses vulnerabilities. So I think it's still mentally connecting the dots and just spending enough time with the step to get in the right mindset. Um, but I wrote a post-it note to remind me of that exact part for when I <laughs> get back to that later today. So thank you. All right, I just uh, wanted to duck down. Uh, Miles, you're, you're on the call here and you had a this question about um, that also kind of related to seeing if strategies were repetitive. And I wondered if you wanted to add a little more detail to your question or, or do you feel like what we've talked about so far has helped? I think that pretty much covered it. Um, I'm gonna go actually print it out and then go back and see where those fit in so I can group those tactics together a little bit more, so. Okay. Great, and be sure to reach out uh, if you're having questions. Um, Lewis, I see you on the call here too. So um, others may have been wrestling with your question. Do we, um, do we treat some of these impacts like inevitabilities? And does that affect how you adapt to them? Um, tough question, tricky question. Um, because we know there's, there's still plenty of uncertainty with how climate change impacts will play out, especially the longer we look into the coming century, that, that departure between best case scenario and business as usual climate scenario gets wider and wider the further out you look. So there, there is some, you know, potentially a pretty wide, um, wide cone of, of plausible outcomes. So do you want to do you want to share a little more about if there's an impact in particular that you're wondering about, gosh, do I treat this as inevitable and wave the white flag or do I spend time trying to surmount this obstacle? Lewis, are you out there? Okay, well, is anyone else wrestling with this as well? Yeah, Kathy? Nope, oh, sorry, I've, I've still got you on, on mute. Are you able to unmute yourself? I'll try, am I unmuted? There you are. Yeah. I have a new computer and I, because the other one <laughs> didn't, the sound didn't work anymore. Uh, we've just decided that most of our goals will be in transition because we can't plan today for 80 years from now accurately. So we'll, we'll just be in transition basically. And our goals may morph over the next 80 years. Does, does that make sense? Because we, you know, we know that our aspen forest is not going to be an aspen forest in 80 years, but we're not going to give up habitat for golden winged warblers. We're trying going to try to shift it as long as golden winged warblers will come here, shift to um, uh, the the uh, shrub scrub area along the uh, creek, which is used by golden winged warblers now. So we're going to try to just shift until they will no longer find it um, a good place to come, I guess. 
So I think you've hit on a nuance here that I want to I want to um, focus on for a minute and uh, make sure that that folks are um, maybe also in the same mindset on this. So you just offered a good example where I think that's kind of like a step three um, decision that you just had with yourself, where perhaps you wrote a management goal or objective that was centered around um, a specific feature uh, in, your, in your ecosystem, like an aspen forest. And let's say climate change projections look very daunting for that aspen forest to continue. And so maybe you had that marked as low feasibility or very challenging. Maybe this is the inevitability that, that Lewis is not sure whether he can cope with um, or not. Then you, in the second part of your discussion there, you made a shift. You said, well, if we can't have Aspen, maybe we can still have golden wing warbler habitat. And that to me seems like a step three sort of discussion where if you decide that a, a objective has low feasibility or is gonna be really challenging, that's that opportunity for critical thinking and, and kind of um, reflection to say, well, if this objective looks hard, what is it I'm actually trying to accomplish? Is it the Aspen maintenance? Not necessarily. Maybe I just want habitat for the golden wing warbler. And so maybe there's an opportunity to re-express that objective as golden wing warbler habitat. That's the thing, rather than the composition of this Aspen forest. And then that opens up some new possibilities for you um, that are not um, that become more flexible. It's not that you're, it's not that you abandoned the objective. I don't want folks to think that, well, we just have to give up our objectives as we march through time because climate change is going to keep punching us in the gut. It's okay to come up with an objective that you want to hold the line on, but you're trying to hold the line for golden wing warbler habitat. Maybe you can give up or, or be flexible on the aspen. Um, and then your adaptation actions are helping you get that golden wing warbler habitat. Still, you know, you're not just uh, uh, perpetually retreating. Um, you're still trying to figure out how can we maintain that, that, um, that effective wildlife habitat. Anyway, a bit of a rant, but I, I hope that was connected with, with something uh, in case some of you are wrestling with that same, same uh, question. Helpful for me, thank you. Okay, before this turns into more um, Stephen rambling hour, I know we're, we're over our assigned class time and, and you all are getting bonus, bonus points for this. Um, are there any final questions or, or shall we wrap it up for today? I have a question. Yeah, Andrew. Um, okay, you're just rant, as you said, you're rambling on, I'm sorry, not a rant. Um, to me, brings up, what I've been thinking about is your our time horizon, okay, whether it's 10 years for young forest habitat, 50 years to 80 years, is gonna change, it's gonna affect how we're gonna monitor things also. You know, I understand a lot of people are monitoring on an annual basis for funding or a yearly cycle, um, but that changes your whole perspective changes on how you're looking at this. So I gather each one of us has to get look at it from our own perspective or our the perspective of who we're trying to um, get funds from. I mean, does that make sense? I, yeah, absolutely. We we deal with um, and we try to be flexible on this. We're not trying to stipulate that you know your monitoring plan needs to run for thirty years in order to gauge effectiveness. You know, we don't put um, shackles on you like that, because just from our NIACS perspective, we, we work with, um, say, counties or, or private consultants who have much shorter time horizons. We work with tribes that have seven generations perspectives. And so absolutely, your, your goals are going to be different. Your monitoring is going to be very different across the time horizon. That's definitely something that is that you should customize.
Okay. Um, thanks again. Uh, we love having y'all on this course. You're asking great questions. I hope you're making great progress. Um, please continue to get in touch with us as instructors. And we will talk to you again next week, if not sooner. Bye, folks. Thanks a lot.